So welcome everyone. Welcome to the very first ever virtual Mother of All Pottery Sales. It's Mother of All Pottery Sales back and more virtual than ever because it's never been virtual before. So today, as I said before, we're going to ask our participants to stay on mute and have you type any questions or comments into the chat. I'll keep my eye on it as Martha is working and read whatever we're getting through. Uh, my name is Michelle Kless. I'm the deputy director here at Union Project. Uh, Union Project is a nonprofit arts organization in Pittsburgh. We've served our community many different ways since we were originally founded in 2001, including the restoration of 155 original stained glass windows, creating space for community events and celebrations, and of course, the renovation and ongoing maintenance of our historic, more than 100 year old building. Uh, now, today, our main program area is ceramics. We offer classes, workshops, group programs, kiln rental, a membership program. Our ceramic studio is striving to offer opportunities for people of all ages and skill levels so that they can learn and create in clay. Every year we have a huge clay celebration, the mother of all pottery sales, and more than a thousand people come out to watch demonstrations and do hands-on activities. And of course, buy ceramic work from artists who all set up shop in our great hall for the day. Of course, in 2020, we did end up canceling the mother of all pottery sales. So when 2021 rolled around, we knew we weren't ready and our artists weren't ready and our community wasn't ready to be in person, but we didn't really wanna skip the celebration for a second year in a row. So we put together an all virtual mother of all pottery sales. We have six demonstrations and artist talks with both local artists and artists who aren't from Pittsburgh, as well as an online shop that uh, people can purchase local pottery made right here in Pittsburgh. Um, this event was made possible with a lot of generous support from both sponsors and foundations. We are really incredibly grateful to the Fine Foundation, Bridgeway Capital, the Creative Business Accelerator, Simpson and McCready, of course, Standard Ceramics, and Union Project, the entire organization is also supported in part by the Allegheny Regional Asset District. So a very big thank you to them. Uh, I'm so pleased to introduce the very first demonstrating artist, Martha Grover. Martha was lined up to be one of the like headlining visiting artists for the 2020 Mother of All Pottery Sales before it was canceled. So we're thrilled and feel lucky to have a second chance at hosting her. Um, Martha is a functional potter, probably most well known for her thrown and altered porcelain pieces. Her work has been described as elegant graceful, fluid, and inviting. Uh, Martha has worked and studied in studios across the country, but today, of course, she's logging in from her own home studio in Maine. So uh, Martha, thank you for being here and also for having us in your studio. I'm gonna kick it over to you now and I'm gonna go ahead and mute myself. Well, thanks, Michelle, for making all of this happen. I, like so many people, I think was incredibly bummed that the mother of all pottery sales didn't happen last year. I was really looking forward to coming to Pittsburgh, and it was kind of, again, the beginning of everything being canceled for a year. So, um, yeah, so I, it was, of course, the right decision, and this is a great decision this year as well. Um, and thank you to the Union Project for inviting me last year and back again this year um, to make all of this happen. So for this demo today, I am I'm going to make a two-part vase. I'm going to throw it in two sections and stack those together. There will be some darts that will happen along the seam as well as some altering. I'll add on a bottom so that we don't end up with a round form at the bottom. We end up with something that's a little bit more triangular. Um, 
Michelle gave me a great little intro, but for those of you who don't know um, too much about me and my work, I am a potter living and working in Maine. I'm back in my hometown, um, a little town called Bethel, which is right on the Maine-New Hampshire border near Mount Washington. We're on the Appalachian Trail. So no lobsters and rocks and ocean up here. It's all pine trees and granite cliffs and moose. <laughs> um, my husband and I have been back here for about six years now. We were in Montana, which is his home state, working at the Archie Bray Foundation. I was a resident there and he was the manager of the clay business there for several years. And um, then I was part of their educational staff. Um, and then we made the decision to come back to Maine. So without further ado, I will start making some pots. So Josh is gonna act as our cameraman. Um, you probably won't see him because he'll be mostly behind the camera, but making sure that you guys have a good view of everything that I'm gonna do. So before you get started, the first thing is always prepping some clay. Now I did some wedging before we all logged on. So everything is all ready to go, but I do tend to wedge my clay before I start to throw it. The clay that I'm working with today is actually some of my reclaim and it is a mix of, um, I get most of my clay from the Archie Bray Foundation. I used it for so many years when I was out in Montana that I really, I loved it um, and it's their gras leg body. But I also, whenever I'm making larger forms, I buy standard 257 because it's such a great kind of versatile body that throws big really, really well. Um, so we love standard as well out here, but I, but this clay is primarily the RT Bray Foundation Grawlig porcelain. And it just has a lot of nice translucency to it. It hand builds and wheel throws well. So I'm gonna get two pieces together. And for the bottom part of this vase, I usually use about a pound and a half of clay, although this vase can be bigger or smaller, but for the one I'm gonna to make today, I'll use about a pound and a half for the top and a little bit less than a pound. I said that backwards, pound and a half for the bottom and a little bit less than a pound for the top. So this is just a little bit heavy. I'm gonna cut some of that off. And I think that one's probably just a little bit light. Perfect. So we got a pound and a half and a pound. And then I'll move over to my wheel. And as I said, I already wedged this clay. So it's kind of all ready to go. And my wheel, I have set up so that I am seated, but I'm seated quite high. I've got my wheel up on some concrete blocks. And then this tall stool has this great um, kind of back leg lifter on the, the bottom of it. Josh will kind of zoom in on that a little bit. So it tilts my pelvis. So even though I'm sitting, I'm never really hunched over at the wheel quite as much as when you have a wheel that is um, low down to the ground. And I find that really helps with my back and hopefully long-term, it'll mean that I'll still be making pots when I'm in my eighties and nineties and um, hopefully keep my everything working for that long. So I'm gonna throw on some bats and the bats that I'm using are wonder bats, although I don't believe that they are still in business anymore. You can get them now, the same um, adapter set up from Studio Pro Bats. Um, they're a company run by Todd Wallstrom and Asia Peltz over in Vermont. Um, and they are working potters, making tools for potters, which I love because all of the you know, it's kind of the, the thing that helps them continue to make really wonderful work. Um, so definitely check them out if you haven't heard of them before, Studio Pro Bats. Um, so this little bat adapter for a long time, I thought they were sort of a, a goofy thing. And then Josh got me a set for Christmas and I all of a sudden realized, oh, it's so great. They take up so little space. You can throw a whole bunch of things and fit them on the shelf together. And so I've been using them almost for, I, I would say probably like 75% of the pieces that I make. So I'm gonna take this pound and a half ball and get it centered in the middle of the wheel. And since the clay is all wedged and uniform and even, um, it's really not gonna take me too much work to get it into the center. My porcelain is a little bit on the soft side as well. Um, so that kind of facilitates easy workability. It's a little bit easier on one's wrists and um, and it just makes a really pleasant experience all around. So now for the bottom of the vase, I'm gonna open all the way down to the bat. And the reason for doing that is that I want to be able to, again, alter this so that the shape at the bottom of the vase is no longer a circle, that it, I will be able to make it into a triangle. And I feel like for me and my work, 
almost everything I make except for bowls and plates, I throw without a bottom. And it really gives me the versatility to be able to alter in so many different shapes that if I leave that bottom in there, I'm somehow always still tied to the circle. So by taking it out, it really kind of inspires some play and some different movement that I might not get if I was working with a piece that actually had a bottom in it to start out with. So you can't quite see all the way down. There's this little skiff of clay that's across there, but it is open all the way to, down to the bat, which is another reason for throwing on a bat. If you throw a thin, thin cylinder that doesn't have a bottom, and then you try to lift it off of the wheel head right after it's thrown, it would just be so soft and floppy. And without that bottom in there to kind of hold things together, it would be difficult to lift. I won't say impossible, but definitely difficult. So as I'm throwing this bottom shape, this is gonna end up being kind of a bulbous form. And for these first couple pulls, I'm really trying to get as much clay up and out of the bottom as I can. Um, porcelain, the thinner you throw it, the more translucency you get. And I really love the way that when the clay is thin, and finished, you can actually start to see light transmitting through it. It kind of gives the piece an internal luminosity that you don't get with other clay bodies. So for me, it's really important to kind of throw just as thin as I possibly can. So then once I feel like the walls are really uniform and fairly thin, I'm gonna to start to shape. And I'll do all of my shaping with two ribs. So I've got a stainless steel rib that I'll use on the outside and a little rubber rib that I'm using on the inside. These are both mud, mud tools. And um, I, I quite like this long, skinny stainless steel one because it flexes really easily. And so I can bend it into the curve that I'm going to shape the bottom of the base into. Now this is doing a couple of things. I am removing all of the slurry from the outside so that my piece will dry a little bit more quickly so that I'll be able to alter it. It's removing all of the throwing lines, which you know throwing lines can be quite beautiful in some people's work, but for my own, I'm trying to sort of erase that process so that you can look at the, the glazes and they'll have a nice smooth surface to melt over rather than having a whole bunch of horizontal lines kind of interrupting that surface. But it's also compressing the surface of the clay so that this um, skin will develop on the outside so that when I start to push it and pull it and change the shape that I won't get any stretch marks or kind of surface cracking happening. Oftentimes when folks first start to alter their pieces, they'll find that the clay kind of wants to separate as you um, start to push and pull on it. And this ribbing process really tends to uh, eliminate some of that. So I'm going over the, the piece three or four times, top to bottom, again, just to make sure that that surface is really nice and tight and uniform, that it's got a nice skin to it. And I'm also happy with the shape with this kind of bulbous form leading down to a fairly narrow foot. Then my last step on everything that I throw is to cut away this little foot that happens at the bottom. And I haven't tried to um, get all of that clay that is uh, kind of skirting out away from the piece up into the form because really this little surface is all that's holding all of this onto the bat since we don't have a bottom inside of the form. So I actually leave that probably a little bit larger than I might if I weren't throwing bottomless until I'm finished with the piece. So now I'm gonna take a wooden knife and take the sharp side of the blade and cut down. And I'm cutting kind of following the form right down to the bat. And then I'll flip it and take the horizontal side and cut underneath and then release this extra skirt of clay from the pot. Sometimes when I do that, it'll leave a little tiny mark at the bottom. That time was pretty good, but if it's got a little bit of a mark, then I just go gently back in with the rib. And at this point, this piece has maybe a quarter of an inch of clay holding it onto the bat. So I really have to make sure that I do that move kind of when everything is all done. Because if I tried to alter the shape at this point, most likely this foot would let go. And we'll pop this guy out and start with the top of the vase. So I'm just gonna set that aside for a little bit and then grab another bat and 
center the top. So again, this, this half is about a pound of clay. So we had a pound and a half for the bottom, a pound for the top. And once again, I'll get centered. Kind of making sure that everything is hooked down onto the bat and uniform from top to bottom. And then once again, I'll open all the way down. So the form that I just threw was fairly bulbous. This one will be the inverse of that. So this will be kind of a, a narrow waisted form, um, sort of that nuclear power plant cooling tower form. Um, and I'll start out by throwing a cylinder. Kind of getting the bottom the width that I want it. Now ideally what I'm looking for is this width here to be similar to the width at the top of the vase. Now, I'm going to take some darts and um, alter things a little bit so there's definitely quite a bit of uh, finagling fudging room um, but kind of generally I've gotten my brain what what size the top of that first vase was and then I'll make this one of similar with a little bit of a narrow waist and then a flare up towards the top and I keep hearing my earring hitting my headphone so I'm going to take just a second and pull my earring out sorry guys I wasn't thinking about it when I put these on this morning that I was going to have a speaker in my ear and then be moving my head around so hopefully that'll take care of that loud clunking noise that keeps happening and of course I put on ones with backs on them. So that'll take just a second. And probably tonight when we go upstairs for dinner, Josh is gonna look at me and say, hey, you've got clay behind your ears. <laughs> it seems like our evening is always that. How did you get clay there, Martha? <laughs> okay, so now that this piece is uniformly thin from top to bottom, I'm just refining the shape. So making that waistline go in a little bit. And again, flaring the top out a little bit more. And then I'll come back in with my two ribs. And of course I managed to drop one of them on the floor. It's the only problem with the tall wheel. It's a long ways down <laughs> when you're sitting on the stool. Um, so once again, I will take this little rubber rib on the inside and my metal rib on the outside. Now my metal rib, instead of using the flat side like I did on the bulbous form, I flipped it around and I'm using the curved side and using that curve to define this shape. And again, I'm scraping off all of the excess slurry and water, giving me a nice tight surface that will alter well, but also erasing all of the throwing lines at the same time. Now I have found over my years of working with porcelain that timing is everything. And I'm sure for you guys working in clay, you have found that as well, that if you try to work with something that's way too wet, it's gonna fight you and want to collapse. If you try to work with something that's too hard and firm, again, it's gonna fight you and try to crack and um, rip itself apart sometimes. So I'm definitely always looking for that sweet spot. So after I throw my forms, it completely depends on the season and the weather outside. So it could be anywhere from 20 minutes to two hours. Um, today is one of those kind of in between spring days where I think it's about 50 degrees outside, a little bit moist, um, but it's still warm enough inside the building that we didn't get a fire going this morning. So it's, it's a little cool and damp in here. So things have been drying pretty slowly. So the pieces that I threw first thing this morning for our demo today, I actually had to use the heat gun on a little bit, even though they'd sat out for a couple hours. So we've got this little guy and you can imagine this is going to stack on top of that. But I'm gonna do something interesting at the seam. So I would typically, again, let these sit out for a couple hours and then move on to the next steps that we're gonna do right now. But this is a demo and I have already made um, seconds of everything. So I think Josh is giving you guys another view of my wheel setup and the height and everything. So this particular form doesn't have any handles, but my usual process would be to throw a whole bunch of stuff, let it set out for 
who knows how long, let's say an hour. And then once it gets to um, this sort of, Kristen Kiefer calls it suede stage. So it's not leather hard, but it's still soft enough that I can push and pull and move. Um, and I've got a couple of these guys that are ready to go. So you can see that the edge is still quite soft, but if I push down on it, it's not gonna collapse. My fingers aren't sticking to it. I'm not making any fingerprints when I touch it. And for me, that's that sweet spot that things are ready to alter. And also a really good time when the forms get to that to make all of my corresponding parts. So if there were mugs, that's when I would pull my handles. For everything else, it would be when I would make my slabs for the bottom. So I've got another lump of clay here, and this is about five pounds of clay. And again, all wedged up and ready to go. And even fresh out of the bag clay, even if it's not reclaim, I always give it a little bit of a wedge first because I find that those outside walls that are towards the outside of the box next to the plastic tend to be a little bit firmer and stiffer. And so when I go to make a slab or throw something on the wheel, I end up with pieces that are uneven or my slab won't stretch evenly because that firmer piece just is, is harder. And so it doesn't want to move in the same way as the rest of the clay. So I find it good to, to wedge everything first. So my first step, I'm gonna make a slab without using a slab roller, is going to be to flatten this log of clay till it's about between an inch and half an inch thick or so. And I'm using a mallet. And my mallet has a sock on it. The sock is just so the clay doesn't stick to the wood. And this is a homemade mallet. Um, a friend at a workshop actually made it for me. I had another one that someone else at a workshop had made for me. And I found that this flat face on the front, which is what you would usually hit something with, made lots of marks with these corners, but this rounded side was a little bit too rounded. So um, this one gal went home and she and her husband had a wood shop and they made me this. I think this is a um, banister railing um, piece like from Home Depot and then just a round um, cylinder that they cut in half and screwed the two, two together. And it makes a really nice mallet. So if you've been resistant to buying one like I was because they do tend to be pretty expensive as far as hand tools for clay go, um, you can make your own. And then again, as I said, the sock is quite nice to release on the clay. So some of the reasons that I make my slabs this way are that for a long time, I didn't own a slab roller or I worked in a studio where there were other people using different types of clay. And with the porcelain, you really have to make sure that you aren't ending up with um, any sort of dust from a stoneware or an earthenware on any of the surfaces that you're working with, because especially if you're like me and you're gonna leave some of that clay raw without any glaze on it, you're definitely gonna see all of those other types of clay showing up on your work. So once I get this pounded out again, somewhere between a half inch and an inch, I'm gonna start tossing it on the table. And this process of pounding and then slamming down on the table makes a slab that is very, very well compressed. We always talk when we're throwing about that you need to pack down the particles in the bottom of the piece. You need to compress the bottom so that you don't end up with S cracks. We talk about compressing a wall. We talk about compressing rims. You need to do the same thing to your slabs. So I find that when I have used a slab roller, that if I just push it through and squeeze it in one direction, the clay particles don't really get packed down in the same way. And so those forms are much more likely to um, want to change shape in the kiln. So porcelain is what's known as pyroplastic, which means that when it gets up to the height of the firing, it actually becomes soft again and able to move. And so by making a slab this way, it's more likely to stay exactly where I put it. So what I'm doing is, as you could see, tossing it on the table, an object in motion wants to stay in motion. So as I'm tossing this down, the front edge catches and then the weight of the slab pulls it towards me. And every time it does that, it stretches. Often when folks try to do this process the first time, rather than doing that, that motion, that um, having the front edge catch first, they slam it down. 
And you'll find that your slab is thick in the middle and thin at the edges because the force is going outwards rather than stretching the slab, if that's the case. So once this gets just about the, yes. I have a question. Yes. What, uh, what is your table surface? <laughs> that is always the question that people ask. And I usually uh, uh, say before I get started, this is just plywood. Um, if you look at the side of it right here, you can see all of the layers. It is furniture grade plywood that has a thin veneer on the top. I used it for a show that I was doing at the Bray. I wanted to make this really big pedestal that almost looked like a dining table. And for the pots that I was putting on it, I thought a darker surface, a wood surface would look really good underneath them. So I stained it and then varnished it with a matte finished varnish. Um, and then, you know, as, as things go in the studio, <laughs> It's always good to recycle when you have a really nice expensive piece of plywood. So when I built this table for the studio, I said, ah, oh, well, that will be perfect. So I cut the end off of it and have been using it as a studio table. Now, if you look at the surface, it's not really shiny at all. I've been using it for a long time. So it's scuffed so that the clay doesn't stick to it too much, but it isn't porous anymore. So the wood grain doesn't lift up. Some plywood tables that I've worked on in other studios when they haven't finished the surface, repeated washing and getting it wet with the clay, um, that wood grain starts to lift up and you get a lot of texture, but this is incredibly smooth. So I can end up with a nice smooth, smooth slab without um, having any extra textures like canvas texture or anything like that that I'm getting rid of. Okay, so this inevitably, no matter how good you are at rolling these slabs, there will be some places that'll be a little bit thinner, a little bit thicker, depending on if your clay is totally uniform, dry, uniformly dry, or your hands may thin out some spots. So I go in with a rolling pin just to smooth that out. Then my last step is I'm going to super compress the surface of this. So I'm gonna take a little tiny spray of water, not much, just a very, very fine mist, and then take a rubber rib. And with that little bit of water on the surface, I'm bringing all of the finest particles up and compacting them down in. And again, this is making a really tight, tight skin that when I bend and move this slab, it's not gonna crack on me at all. So as it bends up around the bottom of a form or folds over to make a little petal or anything like that, that the surface will stay this silky, buttery smooth. And for those of you that have encountered my finished pots in person, hopefully you have felt the bottom of them and felt how nice and silky and soft this porcelain feels. It really feels like polished marble. And I do very, very little sanding. I do uh, maybe 10 seconds of 150 grit when it comes out of the final glaze kiln, but I don't do any other sanding. And this smooth, smooth surface is all happening right here, right now with this slab. So making that, that nice tight surface at the beginning really does carry through to the finest, final finished piece. So I sandwich this between two pieces of drywall and then I'll compact the second surface. So once again, a little tiny bit of water. And there's a beautiful Maggie dog hair. We have a border collie that lives with us in the studio and uh, she gives us presents all the time. <laughs> and of course, these little teeny black hairs, I will see them on finished bone dry pieces and think, oh gosh, how did that crack there? That's such a weird place. And then upon closer inspection, I realize, wait a second, it's just a Maggie hair. So then this slab will sit for probably about an hour. It's on a piece of drywall. The drywall is gonna dry it out from the bottom. The air is gonna dry the top so that it'll dry really evenly and uniformly. The drywall is also very smooth and flat. So it's keeping the slab um, without any bends or folds in it or any strange surfaces. And um, before I let it dry, there's one last little thing. So this edge, um, you can see how it's kind of cracked a little bit and that's just from the clay stretching. And I find that as it sits and dries, that edge wants to dry quicker than the rest of it. I also tend to try to use every last little bit of my slabs that I can. And um, so if I leave this edge on there, sometimes I'm inclined to bring it all the way out to the edge of the piece. And since it's a little bit thinner, it doesn't 
um, dry in the same way and it can try to crack. So I kind of hedge my bets and cut that off from the beginning. Also the knife running through vertically compresses the edge of the slab really, really well. So when we were in Montana, the humidity in my studio was about 10%. Here in Maine, it tends to run around 65%, 70%. It's quite a bit more moist. But in that studio in Montana where it was super, super dry, every now and then, you know, I'd be working late and I would make one of these slabs and I'd set it up on a high shelf to get it out of the way and I'd forget about it. And uh, when I'd come in the next day, it would be bone dry, but it would still be perfectly flat and there would be absolutely no cracks in it. So that tells me that this process of making a slab yields something again that isn't going to crack, that's going to stay where you put it, and that's going to be a really great tool for using as I continue to make my pots. So we'll make the slabs, pull handles if necessary, but we don't need any on this piece. And then I'm going to alter those forms. So these are not the ones that I just threw. These have been sitting for a couple of hours. So again, they've got that skin that we talked about. And for altering, I'm gonna grab a little sponge so that I can get my finger a little bit damp. And this piece, I think I'm gonna make it have three feet. So I'm gonna do three altering marks that are gonna go from the bottom to about two thirds of the way up. And I'll just get my finger damp and then I'm gonna support the top part and I'll try to turn this so you guys can see well. And I'm gonna gently push in and then bring my finger all the way up to that curve and then gently pull out. Then once I've got one in place, I'll divide this into thirds. So I'm just looking down from the top and I can see where the first piece pushed in. And then I'll take my fingers and just push in a little bit so that the distance from here to here is the same as from there to there. And then we'll do three more alterings. So once again, hand on the top to support the piece and then take my finger and push in and then gently pull out. You'll also notice that this is still attached to the bat. I have not wired it off yet. And the reason for that is that it's kind of a second set of hands for you. So it's holding it down to the table. Then I'm gonna do another altering mark where I'm gonna push out from the inside. So I'll find the center point between these two indentations and take my finger and push out. And that just kind of makes this little spine coming up to the side. Now the trick with this type of altering is kind of the Goldilocks affair. You don't want to pu push so hard that you pop through the piece, but you also don't want to be so gentle that you're not making a mark. So you kind of have to find that in-between point. So I usually tell folks that they haven't tried it before, maybe throw yourself a few extra pieces so that you've got some things to play with and just kind of you know push through a couple of pieces so you know how hard that too firm pressure is so that you can, can find that sweet spot in the center. So then I'll gently flip this over and the bottom is quite a bit softer than the top. And this is that what I was talking about at the wheel, how it's really only being held on by a quarter of an inch of clay. That's not terribly much adhesion to hold this whole thing up. Um, but the bottom is quite a bit softer because air could dry out the top, but it's not able to dry out the bottom. So I'll clean up my bat. And then for this top part, I'm not going to do any altering marks on it. So I'm going to keep it fairly smooth so that the bottom has most of the action happening. And that the top, it'll just be the rim that has the fluting on it, which I will do later after it gets attached onto the other piece. But I'm still going to cut it off and flip it over so that this edge has a chance to catch up with the top edge. I also, after I flip these pieces over, I usually grab a plastic bat and I'll set these onto the plastic bat rather than leaving on them on my table or on a piece of wood or even on a masonite bat because the plastic is gonna protect this rim so that I'll be able to alter it later. Whereas some other surface might continue to suck moisture out of the rim and it would make it more difficult to alter later on. So then these guys and our slab, and if it was a piece with handles, all of that stuff would need to dry out for quite a while. But once again, kitchen show, I have another set of pieces that have been thrown longer. I altered before we started this demo so that they are all ready to go and be put together right now in front of all you guys. 
So Josh is gonna get our camera situated so that you guys have a nice view and then um, stop moving it around quite so much since I will be stationary and in one spot. Um, and it'll take just a second to kind of get the tripod in the right place for all of you so that you can see what's going on. And this is gonna be this tall. Perfect. That looks great. So as long as I don't move anything, we're good to go. Can you guys still hear me? Can, you can? Okay. Josh just took his earpiece out and so mine went dead for a second when the when the second iPod AirPod came out of his ear. So, okay. So we've got this bottom that again has um, stiffened up. And um, at this point, when I push down on it, it definitely is firm. However, I can still alter the rim. So just to give you guys an idea, it is still fairly soft, but it does hold its shape pretty well. And I am going to start out and decide where I want the feet to be on this. So the final form is going to kind of raise up off of the table a little bit, have this little bit of a, a gap underneath, a little bit of an airspace to kind of make it feel a little bit more animated and um, like it's dancing across the top of the table. And I think it makes sense having the feet happen right underneath this altering mark. I could, however, I put them over here and then have the raised up spot go into this curve. However, when I've done that, I find that sometimes since this wall has been moved, it remembers that movement in the firing and sometimes wants to pull away and I'll end up with a crack there. So both for the visual aesthetics of it and then also how I know the clay tends to move in the firing, I tend to put the foot right underneath this altering mark. So that's what we're gonna do on this piece. And I'll start out, and sometimes where you've cut it off of the bat, maybe it looks a little bit ragged, a little bit uneven. So most of this is gonna get cut away with the um, cutting down for the feet. But depending on what that surface looks like, I might go in and cut out just like a 16th or an eighth of an inch. Um, just to give me a nice, fresh, smooth, even surface to work with. Also, if you aren't someone that can throw super thin all the way down to the bottom, you could come in and cut in this direction also to thin out that bottom wall, but this is just fine. So I'll mark off where the centers of my feet are going to be, and then come out probably three eighths of an inch on either side so that I'm ending up with a foot that is at least half an inch, if not three quarters of an inch wide. So it's not standing on little teeny tiny points. Um, it's got you know, a good, good amount of clay for it to, to stand on. Then I'm gonna cut away. And as I cut, I'm holding my knife at a bevel. This is doing a few things. By cutting diagonally, you can see how much more clay I have exposed on the surface in order to make a nice strong connection between the slab at the bottom. Also, this diagonal is going to aid in the slab bending up around the bottom and looking very organic and having less of a right angle at that cut. Um, then it's also making a very thin edge right in the center where it's laying into the slab, which is gonna make that interior seam, which I don't think the camera will probably focus all the way down inside. Well, maybe, maybe right there. Um, you can see that it's a nice smooth transition between the side walls and the slab at the bottom. And a lot of that comes from this angle that I just cut. Then, as I said before, I don't really want this to remain a circle. I want it to turn into a bit more of a triangle. So I'll take my finger and on the inside, I'm gonna push out in three places right on those feet. So then we can see that our bottom has become a triangle. And that'll get exaggerated up at the top as well when I take my darts. Then I've got a slab that has been sitting for quite a while. And the slab, as it sits, it of course dries out and starts to feel incredibly firm, like it doesn't wanna bend. 
But lucky for us, porcelain is what's called fixotropic, which means the more you move it, the softer it becomes. And so taking this slab and then just slapping it down on the table a few times, you guys will see how much more movement I'm able to get out of it um, and how much more supple it becomes. And I think Zoom is probably gonna, um, it tends to mute out those loud noises so you guys can't hear them. And I don't know if it makes it so you can't hear me at the same time too. So this is stretching a little bit but it's also just that movement. You can see how much more flexible and floppy this slab suddenly becomes. But as we all know, stretch marks are inevitable. So now that I have stretched this on the tabletop surface, I'm gonna go in and rib it just a little tiny bit to make sure that it's nice and smooth. And I'll do this on the top and the bottom. And again, this is developing that skin that is going to become the final finished surface on the bottom of the pot and make it nice and silky, silky smooth. Then I'll cut a piece that is at least half an inch too big all the way around. And I do tend to just eyeball this. Um, I could take the, the piece and set it on top of the slab, but having made this form several times, several thousand times, um, I've got a pretty good sense of the size it needs to be. Um, and once again, since I stretched it just a little bit more, I'm gonna recompress the surface. Now I stretched it just a little bit more, not for size, but for thickness. So what I'm aiming for is for the slab and the throne pot to be just about the same thickness. And I usually look at the thickness up at the rim rather than what's happening down at the bottom because this bottom, you know, that bottom half inch or so is a little bit different than the rest of the form. So mostly paying attention to that top rim that I think gives me a better sense of what the whole piece is doing. Then we'll make sure our triangle is still fairly even. And I'm gonna take my slab and lay it over the top and gently start to manipulate it down into the shape of my form. And I gotta grab my, sponge that I was using to wet my finger to alter so that I can get the edge of this rib just a little bit damp um, so that it'll glide over the surface more easily. So I'm pressing the two parts together so that I know where I need to flip and score. And this is saving me the trouble of flipping the pot over, tracing, flipping it back over when I might in that process kind of uh, start to change the shape or alter things. And you can see it makes a pretty nice impression. So then I'm gonna slip and score. And this is my joining slip. If you, it's, it's not gelato, that would be even better, wouldn't it? <laughs> but it was quite wonderful when I ate it to get the container. <laughs> um, so this joining slip, if you are interested in it, it is a combination of toilet paper, vinegar and bone dry clay of whatever clay body you're using. And I find it works really well to stick parts together. You can see it's kind of a sour cream consistency. Um, if you want to know how to make it, if you go to my website, which is marthagrover.com, in the gallery section, there is one section called in process. And it's got a whole bunch of pictures of making things at the studio. And then it's got some video clips down below it. Um, I have a full length DVD with the Ceramic Arts Network um, and they have put three or four clips from the video on to YouTube to be able to watch. And one of those is how to make my joining slip. But the proportions for the joining slip are um, two cups of white vinegar and seven squares of cheap toilet paper. I didn't count, someone counted at a workshop because I wanted to know exactly how many. And then so subsequent workshops, you know, when I pull out the, the length, everybody counts and it's always almost seven, it's either seven or eight, depending on how thick it is or thin it is. And then I mix those two together with an immersion blender. So that makes kind of a paper pulp in the vinegar. And then into that, I add pieces of bone dry clay. So the bone dry clay is in little chunks that, you know, are, are kind of like, that size or smaller. It doesn't have to be totally pulverized. And then I just mix it up with a spoon so that it looks kind of like cottage cheese consistency. 
Let it sit overnight. The vinegar is going to break down all of the clay. There's actually a chemical reaction that starts to happen between the vinegar and the clay, and it releases carbon dioxide. So it gets all bubbly and foamy. So don't put a lid on it because your container will try to explode. Um, and I had a chemist in a workshop once, and they told me what the whole chemical reaction that was going on was. And at the end of it, it, it sounded like it somehow makes the clay even stickier. I can't remember the details now. It was several years ago. Um, but basically, the vinegar breaks down the clay differently and um, the acid helps it to bond. Um, so some of you may have used Lana, uh, Lana Wilson's um, magic water, where she takes water and adds sodium silicate to it, um, or Darvan, and the vinegar does something very similar to that. Then the paper pulp acts as a physical binder between the two. So all the little paper fibers are holding the piece together as it dries. They burn out in the bisque kiln, but they get you through the drying stage, which is often where a lot of cracking happens. So I just showed you guys a little um, view of the bottom of this. And I haven't done any smoothing yet, but with that thin, thin edge, the two pieces are actually almost totally smoothed together already. But to finish that up, I'm going to take a paintbrush. This is a short filbert tip. So it's, it's rounded at the top, um, but has short bristles and they are kind of uh, medium, soft, stiff. They're that, again, Goldilocks in between. And I find it works really well for smoothing seams. It's also got a nice long handle so that I can get down inside of the pot um, without having to get my hand down in there as well. And then I'm pulling out any extra slip and smoothing the two pieces together. So I'll get the inside all sorted out. And I've got the brush damp, but not sopping wet. So I usually dip it into my water bucket and then kind of squeeze it out either on my sponge or on the lid of my joining slip container. So now by just going around it once or twice, it is super smooth and that's gonna be the final inside corner. So I don't futz with it too terribly much, just enough to get the job done. Then out here, I'm gonna do the same sort of thing. So I'm smoothing out any excess scoring lines, removing any extra slip and just kind of smoothing in that seam between the two. And then my next step, I'll move you guys just a little bit closer so that you can see me make this cut. See how many adjustments I can do on my tripod all at once. Josh is out making pots in the other room. Okay. Just had to turn so that this is in this spot. Ugh. Too many, too many options. Okay, I think that's gonna hold there. Okay, so now I'm gonna make my cut at the bottom. So I start out and I'm going to make a little tiny mark in front of each one of the feet. And unfortunately, the camera wants to focus on what's closest to it, my finger <laughs> rather than over here. And I haven't found a good way on my iPhone to force it to stay focused in one place. But hopefully if I get the, my hand out of the way, you'll be able to see. And then I'm gonna cut. And the pattern that I'm going to cut is a series of points and curves. So I do a point in front of each one of the feet and then this long swooping curve out in between. Now for me, this is a reference to um, when flowers bloom, often they've got this little um, kind of green part that goes around the bud. If you think about a rose, it starts out as this little green casing and then the rose emerges from inside of that and then that hangs out at the bottom, it's called the calyx. And so for me, this, this piece at the bottom sort of, it looks a little bit like that, and then it also um, is, stays the porcelain that the piece was made out of. And um, I don't know, it's just kind of a, a reference to where the, the, the form grew from. So this edge now, that's the shape I cut. So points and curves, points and curves. And it looks very orthogonal. It looks like it was cut with a knife. It does not look like it is um, something organic or that was grown on the pot. So I want to change that and make it look more like a thrown edge. So I add a little tiny bit of moisture and then I'm gonna take my index finger and thumb and squeeze the slab all the way around. And that's gonna smooth out those two corners. 
and um, make this edge just a little bit thinner, but also make it look a lot more organic. So I go back and forth between using the sponge and using my fingers as I kind of go back and forth between those. This also makes that edge really nice and supple so that I can then start to bend it up and around the form. Now I didn't go back and do any more slipping and scoring on the slab, even though it's gonna wrap around and get attached through here. There's usually enough slip left over and really I'm only coming at most half an inch away from that bottom seam. It looks like it's further because of this curve, but really it's attached right there. Um, so I have yet to ever have one of these slabs pop off or come away from the form. If they do move, if we look at this, this finished guy, if they move out just a little bit, it gets filled up with glaze anyways. So it's kind of my glazing insurance policy also. You can see on this that my glaze does have some fluidity to it. And so this little gap that we're doing right here, not really a gap, but the seam, this connection between the two is the place that the glaze will go to and stop. Um, I haven't scraped a shelf from my own work in a very, very long time. Although every time I say that, I think, oh gosh, am I tempting fate? So once this starts to get bent around, then I'm gonna take my fingertip and just make sure that that edge is actually hooked on all the way around, except for right here. I'm gonna pull that out into another little flower petal when I get it flipped right side up. So far so good, everybody can see. It's kind of an interesting angle for me because I've got the, the phone between my face and the pot. <laughs> but it means you guys can see well, so that's good. So then, as I said, I left this little area unhooked. So when I flip it over, and I'll back you off just a tad again, you can see the whole thing. And then I'm going to come in and pull this little edge out. And almost like you do when you're making a spout on something, I'm gonna hold the edges of it and then pull it out. And I know my hands are in the way, but it is, it's definitely a motion that feels very similar to pulling a spout on a pitcher, just to pull that little edge out. And again, it is sealed all the way. So glaze will go in there and pull, but there isn't a crack at the bottom. So my vases don't leak, I promise something like that. So then we've got this nice layer of petals happening at the bottom. So then the top, as I said, is gonna stack here. But I always feel like anytime you make a seam, make a joint between two things, it's an opportunity to make some other kind of statement. And um, why just make the two blend like they were seamless? Why not take the opportunity to make this something a little bit more interesting? So. I'm gonna change your angle so you guys aren't quite so um, skewed so you can see these darts. Okay, so I'm gonna put the darts right over this little petal that we made. And very handily, Shimpo, when they made these banding wheels, divided them into thirds. So I'm gonna set my feet so they're right in the middle. You probably can't really see it on the video, but I have drawn in the sixth line. So I've divided the thirds in half and I'm lining up my foot with that. So then I can take this line and translate it up to the top so that I know I'm putting these darts on in exactly thirds. Whereas this, I kind of eyeballed it. This is gonna be the connection and I have to make a cut on the top also. So I wanna make sure that it's actually gonna line up. So for my darts, I am going to cut out a V shape. However, I'm gonna do it in one fluid movement from the bottom down up to the top so that I don't have a place right here if I cut and then cut where the knife blade would be coming together and that would want to split. It's actually more of a U because I cut down and all the way around. And you could take your first cut and use it as a template or you can take a cut and then put it into the hole that you've already made and see if it looks like it's the same size. Um, again, I've made this cut several times, so they usually end up being fairly close. And then I've got a bucket that I'm putting all of my scraps into. I'll take a little bit of water and smooth up this edge. And then just like I did on the bottom, I'm gonna take my fingertips 
and smooth out that edge so that they don't look as um, orthogonal anymore. And then these darts, I'm not going to try to hide the fact that they happen. Again, I'm kind of celebrating the seam, celebrating the attachment method. So I don't want to make it disappear. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to push one edge in on each side and then pull one edge out. So we're ending up with this kind of crazy looking thing. And then I'm going to slip and score inside, outside, inside, outside, all the way around the piece. So we'll add a little bit of slip to each one. And I'm a big proponent of slip first, score second, because I feel like if you score first and then put your slip on, you inevitably have to go back and score a second time because the action of putting the slip on kind of obliterates your scoring lines. However, if you put the slip on first and score, you end up with the same result in two moves rather than in three. And you don't have to change tools between your hands. So it kind of, it speeds things up just a little bit. Then I will take these and overlap them. And you can see how this is making this little kind of nice point out on the shoulder. Um, it almost, uh, they look a little bit kind of like Victorian shoulder lines with the puffed sleeves that sometimes came to a point at the edge. It defines the waistline a little bit, makes it a little bit narrower in the center. And again, has a fun time playing with the seam, the connection between the two parts, which I enjoy. So I'm overlapping those and then squeezing them together a little bit. Then I'll take my handy dandy filbert brush and just wipe out the connection, but I'm not trying to get rid of that ledge that happens between the two, because I think the glaze does an interesting thing where it breaks over that line. And then on the inside, I'll just run my finger over it to smooth it out. So this is why I said it wasn't totally necessary when I was throwing to get the calipers out to measure the um, connection between the top and the bottom because I knew I was going to do some cutting and shaping and that I'd have some room to be able to uh, make things bigger or smaller as necessary. So that brought that in quite a bit from where it was before. Then we'll move on to the top. And this guy, again, you can see where it was attached to the bat. It is a little bit funky. So just like I did on the bottom of the other piece, I'll take my knife and come along and cut that off. It also sometimes feels a little bit drier as well, because I think the masonite bats kind of pull out some of the moisture from there. Then rather than leaving this flat, I'm going to cut a pretty connection between the two. So I'll utilize the marks on the banding wheel one more time, and I'll divide this into thirds and then into sixths, something like that. And then we're gonna cut a pattern and it's gonna be the same pattern that I did at the bottom. So I'm gonna do a point and then a curve and up to another point and then another curve, a point and the last curve and then up to the last point and hopefully end in the same place that I began and pull those back. So you can see that shape going all the way around the edge. Can't really see it so much in that direction. Then we'll take this edge and once again, treat it so that it looks very organic and smooth, add a little bit of moisture and then run it between my index finger and thumb. Any more questions, Michelle? Everybody's just watching away. <laughs> any come through, but I would well, love good. to invite people to ask questions <laughs> in the chat box. So then this is one of those fudging moments between the two sizes. If this seems a little bit too small or too big, if it's too small, I'll take my finger and I'll push out from the inside to kind of splay all of that out so that it'll fit a little bit better. Or if it seems a little bit too big, I can come back to this bottom form and stretch this just a little bit. And in the case of this one, this was just a little bit smaller, I think. And we'll take this guy and I'm gonna line my points up with my dart. So hopefully this lines up with this, lines up with this, if all goes well. 
And if we did our thirds right, it'll do that all the way around. So then the connection between this two, these two is looking something like that. And I'm not gonna try to hide that connection. So on this finished one, again, you can, you can kind of see where that joint is, but the glaze melts over it. And I don't think that it, it, it bothers one at all to look at. So, um, so that remains there. So once I know that these two are gonna fit together well, then I will slip and score along this edge on the outside and along the inside of the other piece. So add that nice joining goop and then score. You know, it's funny thinking back on our own processes and growth and building. And I remember that there was a time that I made altered work before I owned a banding wheel. And now I think back on it and think, gosh, how did I do that? Because I really, I use the spinning of this wheel so much and, uh, it makes things so much easier to be able to hold your hand in one place. Like when I'm doing all of my cuts, I'm moving the piece rather than moving the knife. And the knife pretty much just stays stable in one place. And I think that's what makes the cut so smooth. And again, I know that I did it before I owned a banding wheel, but I don't know how. So then we'll take these two and stack them up. And I often will back you guys up just a little bit so you can see the top, kind of make you level. There we go. Um, I'll, I'll try to make sure that this is level on the top so that I know that it's going on straight. That seems a little bit better. Okay, we've got a question in. Um, awesome. Yeah. It's a question from one of our more beginning artists. Uh, the mm -hmm. question is about porcelain and if it's the same as white clay, and if not, what are the differences? I embellished a little bit to the question. <laughs> so porcelain is a very specific type of clay. The porcelain that I'm using is a high fire clay. So I'm firing actually up to cone 11. Um, so I'm firing up to about 2320. Um, in my electric kiln, and um, which is hot for firing in an electric kiln. Um, but porcelain is primarily made out of kaolin and silica. Um, and the kaolin that's used for it is a very, very pure form, meaning that it doesn't have much iron in it, so that it's very, very white. Um, and that when it, it gets fired up to temperature, it becomes very glassy. So if you took one of these porcelain pieces and put a light bulb inside of it, turn the light bulb on, you'd actually be able to see the light glowing through it. And that doesn't happen necessarily so much with a stoneware or an earthenware or a brown clay body or even some white clay bodies. So the, the type of kaolin that is in this particular body is called Brawleg. And um, it is, I think for this clay body, it is, um, kaolin that's been mined in England, um, but there are kaolin deposits all over the world. And porcelain was first made actually by the Chinese in the region of the city of Xingdezhen. And there's a mountain there um, called Mount Gaolin, and it is a primary source of kaolin that is super, super, super pure. And the potters in that region discovered that if they mined their clay there and um, they had developed kiln technology so that they could fire very, very hot at that point. And they made these vessels, fired them super, super hot, that the clay actually became translucent and that you could see light through it. Um, and that happened in the 13 and 1400s in China. There are a couple of really great books about the history of porcelain. Um, one is called The Arcanum by Janet Gleason, and it's about Europeans trying to figure out how the heck to make porcelain, because for a long time, porcelain vessels were being imported from China into Europe, and the Europeans at that point were only making earthenware and stoneware pieces and had absolutely no idea how to make this clay. Um, so it reads kind of like a murder mystery novel. People were imprisoned by the king, and 
um, is totally fascinating and ends up with the formation of the Meissen factory, which is still in existence today. Um, and the other book is called The White Road by Edmund DeWall. He's the man that wrote the book, The Hair with the Amber Eyes. And he was, he's a potter, which is pretty cool. Um, and he was invited to do a solo show at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And he decided that he wanted to learn about this material that he was gonna use for the show. Um, and so he, he researched the origins of it. So he kind of goes through that whole Silk Road trade and then um, Europeans figuring out how to make porcelain um, from, you know, just kind of hit or miss actually. Um, they tried a lot of different things. Um, Bone China comes out of that era where they uh, ended up actually using ground up cow bones for the calcium in their clay um, in order to make something that approximated the porcelain that was coming from China. I find it totally fascinating. Um, so porcelain, the properties that I talked about when I was working with the slab where the more you move it, the softer it becomes, but it's thixotropic does make it slightly problematic for beginners, not impossible. Um, but it is a little bit more difficult to work with than um, some white clay bodies and some um, brown clay bodies or clay bodies that have any type of uh, grog in them. Um, let's see if that's going to focus. Looks like maybe. So I'm going to start to uh, treat this edge. So I'm going to do a little cutting and a little altering. So at this point, as I said before, everything is still pretty soft. So you can see I can still wiggle things around, but I am able to build a vessel that is um, strong and um, not collapsing on us. My tripod doesn't seem to want to stay exactly where I put it. There we go. Sorry, you guys are kind of tilty. Let's see if we can straighten that up too. I feel like you're on a... <laughs> okay. Um, so I hope that answered that question. That was kind of a very long um, answer, but um, porcelain is just a, a yeah. Um, in my slide talk, I talk quite a bit about that because I think the material that we choose to make our work can also make some kind of a statement. And I feel like that interesting history um, kind of makes this, this substance seem almost magical in some way. And when you hear the word porcelain, you kind of think of your grandmother's china, or those fancy teacups that our grandmothers often had, and you know something that that is is sort of precious in a way. And even though most of us interact with our Kohler sink and, sinks and toilets more often than we do with um, fine china porcelain vessels, um, I think it kind of imbues the material with this sense of mystery and discovery, and um, talks about trade through the years. I don't know. I think it's it's kind of interesting. Um, so. I like, I like that history that it brings to my pot. And so now we've cut down from the edges and I've smoothed those out. So now I'm gonna take this edge and start to bring it out a little bit right over again, I'm working right over that point and where the dart is. And I'm just holding the edge and then using my finger to smooth this out. And then this long swooping one, I'll do the same sort of thing where I'm going to take it and bring it outwards. And it's really amazing with this porcelain, again, that, that uh, property of the more you move it, the softer it becomes. You can really take something and let it sit. We always talk about clay waking up. Um, like you can, even if you're not working with porcelain, if you've got a bag of stoneware and it seems pretty firm, you can drop it on the floor a couple of times and then it all of a sudden feels a lot softer. So for me, I feel like I utilize having a piece that has sat for a while, but maybe hasn't lost all of its moisture and I can build with it and then do all kinds of things and then wake up just one specific area to allow me to be able to alter just that. So I'll back this guy's this guy up so you guys can see the finished product. So there we have it. There's the, the two-part porcelain vase. So the next thing I was going to do for you guys, if you are interested, I was going to take you on a little tour of my studio. Can yes. Pause for one more question. Yes, of course. Yeah, so the question is about um, your process, which is really unique. 
Um, Karina's curious how long it took you to develop it and what artists have inspired you? Oh, that's a great question. I move so I'm in the camera too, and then you guys can see my face <laughs> a little bit. Um, so for me, I first learned how to throw when I was in high school and absolutely loved it, but I had no idea that you could actually go to school for ceramics at that point. And um, so I was interested in art and good at math. And so my guidance counselor told me, well, maybe architecture would be a really great thing for you to study. So I ended up at a small liberal arts school in Vermont called Bennington College, studying architecture, never having drawn a building in my life. It was kind of, you know, <laughs> talk about jumping into something that you really don't know what you're doing. Um, and I found that the first couple of years in the architecture program, I loved the drafting by hand. I loved building models, but I, I wasn't so interested as soon as we started designing on CAD. Um, and I also found that I was much more engaged with the building of the model than I was designing the whole structure. Um, so I knew there was some kind of a disconnect there that I wanted to be working with my hands, making something um, much more than thinking about space and, and people in space. Although I enjoyed the functionality of space. I enjoyed thinking about how people were going to move from public spaces to private spaces and, and what the space would feel like, which I think is maybe also relates to me being a functional potter that I always think about, you know, how is someone going to interact with this vessel? Where is their hand going to go on a handle? What is the, the stream of water going to look like coming out of a pitcher? Um, but I was very lucky and Bennington happened to have a ceramic studio or still does have a ceramic studio. Um, and so my sophomore year, I found my way into the clay studio and started taking another throwing class and absolutely loving it. So by the time I got done, I did my thesis in architecture. However, I did my senior show in clay. And from there, I didn't really know what to do. I didn't have a good enough portfolio that I felt like, oh, I can apply for graduate school. I didn't, I'd never heard of a residency. I didn't know that was an option. And I was really lucky. Um, a woman named Sarah Panzarella, who owns a gallery now in upstate New York and is married um, to, oh gosh, isn't that terrible when somebody's name just jumps right out of your head? Um, it'll come back to me in just a second. Jeremy Randall. Oh my gosh, that is terrible. They're good friends and I hate it when that happens. Um, so they had just gotten done. I think Jeremy had gotten his MFA from Syracuse University and Sarah was at Bennington getting her master's in teaching, thinking about going and being an art teacher. They offered a, a fifth year program. Um, and since they had just come from Syracuse, they were like, well, Martha, maybe you should go do a fifth year program at Syracuse University. It was before places started calling it a post bac program, which a lot of universities have now. And I, when I got there, I had gone from a 10 by 10 studio space at Bennington. I was making these really large thrown coil built vessels. Um, you know, kind of the bigger you can throw, the better at at that point in my thinking. And when I got to Syracuse, I had these two little tiny shelves and half a table to work on. So I suddenly had very, very little space. And um, one of the teachers gave me the project of replicating a historical piece. And I had just discovered the amazing George Orr. And if you guys have never heard of George Orr, definitely go and look him up. Um, he was a potter in Biloxi, Mississippi, back in the late 1800s, who made these insane vessels. And so I decided that I was going to try to make a George Orr piece. And that kind of set me off on this uh, time of altering and doing all kinds of crazy things. I made a whole bunch of super crazy teapots. Um, I started altering rims and doing all this pushing and pulling. And then at some point, this is an old piece from that time period. I started adding these little tiny curly Q feet at the bottom. Um, it was just a, a really fun time that I did a lot of, of playing and altering. And that's kind of set me through everything that I've been doing ever since. So I started graduate school making thrown and altered um, very um, organic forms. And I finished graduate school doing the same thing. I mean, of course the, the pieces grew and changed and all of that, but the basic premise of making elegant organic uh, floral inspired functional forms started by graduate school and finished my graduate school and it's what I've been doing ever since. So I finished graduate school in 07. 
Um, and I think I would say I probably started this body, you know, with these pieces. Again, you can see that they're kind of a, an infant stage of what I'm doing now. Um, these were like 2003 or so. Um, so I've, I've definitely been doing this body of work for quite a while. Um, so it was a very long winded answer to that question. Um, but I, I just love playing with what the clay can do and kind of pushing those limits of, well, how big can I make this? How much can I push this? What is the limit of what the clay will allow me to do? And, and um, then also within that, how can I make something that feels elegant, that feels graceful, that um, is inviting for someone to use and take into their home? And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a, a fun journey. Um, I don't know, you know, who knows in the future where my work will go. I keep thinking about different surface decorations. Um, I've been thinking about stripes for a really long time. And um, I've started adding some striping on, um, you can see on this mug, there's some vertical striping happening, but I'm actually more excited about these copper stripes that I have going on the inside. Um, and kind of playing with some of those sorts of things. I don't know, I mean, you know, who knows, who knows where our work will take us if I'll start exploring surface and representational something at some point. Um, I'm not sure, but I've always been much more of a form person than a surface person. So I, I really love playing with the clay. So for me, this right now, this um, kind of suede, almost leather hard stage of the clay is my absolute favorite. Um, I love the matte surface and how the light interacts with it right now. If the, if the work could stay exactly like this, I, I would probably be just fine. I've learned to love a little bit, uh, glaze a little bit more as time has gone by, but it's, it's been a, a slow slog for me. I definitely, like I said, I, I love the wet clay the best along the way. Any other questions before we go on a tour? So far, so good. Okay. All right. I'm going to unhook you guys from my tripod and grab my battery pack. It's amazing how zooming really eats up everything. So as I told you guys at the beginning, my husband and I moved from Montana to Maine um, six years ago. Sorry, things are a little chaotic in here right now. And I inherited a um, 6,000 square foot warehouse building. So that's where our studio is. But my studio is like 12 by 12. Um, so I've got this small space that I'm working in, but I've got just enough shelving to when the shelves are full. I just did a glaze firing a few days ago. So I'm at the beginning of a making cycle. So everything is empty right now which, you know, for me, it feels like, oh my gosh, I got to, I got to get making. Um, but it's, it's just enough space to make the work and um, everything else happens somewhere else. Whereas in all of my other residencies and um, graduate school and whatnot, I would have to glaze and photo and ship and pack and in a space that was about this big. So I suddenly feel like this feels like a lot, a lot of room, but it also, I don't know, I think working in a small space is good for me rather than you'll see the, the big space. So my husband, Josh, is a potter as well. And until this summer, he was a full-time potter. Um, but this summer he was approached, he was headhunted by Scut, and he is now one of their technical support crew. So if you call Scut, um, because you've got questions about kilns, you may end up talking to Josh. So there's the face that might be on the other end of the phone. But he right now is making a whole bunch of mugs um, for a brewery that is in Massachusetts that he, here's some of their, that's one of their mugs. And um, so for their, their mug club. So he's in the middle of an order, a replacement order for that, for them. And then um, down here, we have a glaze lab. And it's a little bit extravagant for two potters. But when we were thinking about studios and different studios we've been in, we both hated seeing all of the bags of dry material that end up often being scattered throughout. I actually just refilled a whole bunch of bins. So I've got all these bags of empty bags um, that need to, we always, cut off the label that tells you what batch it is and keep it on the side um, of whatever 
of course I can't find it on the one that I pull out. Um, but if there's ever a problem with a batch, we'll know exactly what it came from. So we've got a piece of the bag in there. Um, and that hasn't happened yet. Um, so, so we do have bags in the studio right now, but we usually don't. Um, so it's a nice clean space for glazing. And then I spray all of my glazes. So when we moved into this building, I built a spray booth and I'll back off a little bit. So maybe you guys can see it. It is an, a shower stall that I built a table to go underneath it. And then it's got a filter that goes into the wall with a fan that goes outside. Um, of course, I'm in Maine, so just like Pittsburgh, you know, we have winter here. Um, so there's a cover that goes over the, the fan vent. Um, and then this used to be, so this room out here was the break room for the machine shop that we are in. And so it used to have a whole bunch of lockers and kind of a little kitchen area. So it kind of made sense to make it the glazed kitchen. And then this was a bathroom that had a shower and a toilet and a sink. And we pulled all of that out and put in a big kitchen sink and um, my spray booth. Then since we had all of this space and we'd also, we come from the Archie Bray Foundation, which is a wonderful ceramic residency program in Montana. Josh and I, for the first year we were here, really sort of felt um, the, a lack of community because we're in small rural Bethel, Maine. And there are a couple potters here, but they'd never offered classes. And so the community kind of, I remember having a conversation with someone from high school and they were like, you're a potter. People actually still do that. Um, so there really was no sense of kind of that being a potter was a, a viable career path. Um, so since we were paying to heat this whole space and property taxes on this huge space, we decided to start to offer classes. So we bought a wheel one at a time, one at a time, one at a time for the last six years. And so now we've got, we actually have 10 wheels. We've pulled one out to kind of space everybody out a little bit. Um, and then we scored some really great shelving from a local high school that was getting new shelving in their library. So those are all of the student shelves. Um, here, I have to load a student bisque. Um, so those are a whole bunch of my students' pots. And then this is our, our kiln room back here. We've got kind of a kiln zoo. We are, even though Josh works for SCUT, we are definitely not brand centric. We've got an L&L and two SCUTs. And then this is my workhorse. So I have a cone art kiln. However, I bought it from Bailey. So it's always kind of confusing. It's got two labels on it, but it was built in Canada by, by cone art. Um, and sold to me by Bailey. And it is a great big oval kiln. Typically I fire this puppy um, once, a, well, twice a month, once for bisque, once for glaze. And for a bisque kiln, I can fit 100 to 150 pots, depending on what they are. For a glaze, it's more like 80 or 90. Um, but it's, it's one of the biggest purchases I've ever made. <laughs> um, and we got it right when we moved to this building. And this, um, as I was saying, I fire up to cone 11. It's got the regular brick, but then it's got a layer of fiber on the outside. And you can see this lid is quite a bit thicker as well. It's got the same brick and then um, fiber on top of it. It's also got an element in the floor of the kiln. So it is made to go to cone 10. Um, I'm not pushing its limits by any means. Um, but this is the, the extra space. So we teach three classes a week. And before Josh started working for SCUT, um, he taught most of the classes, but once he started working for SCUT, I'd now teach all of the classes. So I teach three days a week and the rest of the time is my working time. We have a little gallery space. So this is some of Josh's work on this side and my work on this side. And it's Maine and spring. And amazingly, the snow pile has disappeared, but we are just barely on to daffodils right now. So we're probably a little bit behind you guys. Then down here, so these, these spaces are studios. We came from down there. So that's my studio and Josh's studio, kind of my studio's here and Josh's studio's there. Um, that we came from. These all used to be the office spaces for the machine shop. And this one, we ripped out a wall. You can see where the wall used to be. And we have our office spaces. This is Josh's Scut Central. 
Um, so kind of where he answers everybody's questions from. And <laughs> Josh is very neat, Martha is a little messy. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of computer work that seems to happen for POTS. And then my back stock of POTS. So somewhere along the way, someone said to me, always have enough POTS in your studio that if a gallery calls and says, can you do a solo show tomorrow? You can say, yes, yes, I can. <laughs> Um, so I always have lots and lots of pots in the studio. And then over here, this is my online shop of what's available right now. I'm getting close to doing an update. So it's a little bit, I've got to actually have an empty shelf. <laughs> so I need to update some pots. And this is our studio friend, um, Miss Maggie. She is a wonderful studio dog. You hardly even know that she's here. Um, and she has her, her amazing ratty throne that moved with us from Montana. <laughs> she spends most of her time in or under that chair. So I think that is most of our studio. So I'll flip this around. And I'm a little bit, um, that was a little bit less than two hours. Um, do you guys want me to do something else? Or does everybody feel happy and uh, like they've seen seen enough. What do you think, crew? Are there questions or last minute requests? I think my something? hands were working fast today. Usually this takes me almost two hours, but I got done Does quick. It really? <laughs> yeah. Even when you're not doing a demo. Well, no, when I'm not doing a demo, it probably takes me like 45 minutes, but um, usually in the, the talking through everything, it, I'm a little slower. <laughs> How does that compare to like doing a mug, right? So a mug, um, you know, the throwing probably is like two minutes worth of throwing. And then um, the putting together, it's the same, put on a bottom, attach a handle, um, alter the rim. So a lot of the processes are the same between the base that I just did and a mug, but um, but I don't have that that added piece at the top. So I don't know, probably the hand building takes like half an hour on one of these guys, but if I'm doing a, a Zoom demo, it's probably more like an hour 15. Um, it's amazing how when you have to talk through everything, how oh, it takes a little bit more time. And of course I'm making a slab and usually I'd make the slab for 20 pieces instead of just for one piece. So um, that as far as efficiency goes, <laughs> uh, takes it down a little bit. But, yeah. yeah, I've um. I've seen a lot of your work, right? A lot of vases, a lot of mugs, some really stunning flower pieces. I'm curious if you have any um, vessels that you really don't want to make. Like, are there oh. any pots, any forms that you're like, yeah, you know what? I'm not doing that. I'm not into hmm. tumblers. That's a good question. I'm trying to think of things that I tend to avoid making. Um, I can't think of anything. I'm I'm just always excited to be to be making pots in the studio. Um, oh gosh! So I have a, a special order right now for a cake stand, and I don't mind making cake stands. I like making normal size cake stands, but this is for a wedding cake, and they want the bottom to be, or you know, the the top of it to be like this big. And I have been putting it off and putting it off. The wedding isn't until July. So I'm kind of getting to the end of when I can actually continue to put this off. Um, and uh, just because I'm so nervous about how it's gonna work out. Like I've made lots of, you can see the platters behind me. I mean, those are, are decent sized platters. I've made big things before. I make big mirror frames and big perfume bottle pieces, but this cake stand, I'm just, I don't know. I, I have uh, visions of lots of cracking and slumping. And so I've been avoiding making it um, to the point where I was talking about clay bodies and I mostly use my Archie Bray porcelain, but whenever I'm making something big, I get standard clay. And I've got three boxes of standard sitting behind me waiting to be this cake stand. And I just, I keep putting it off. So they're your motivation. Um, they're like, we're yeah. not going anywhere. <laughs> You're like, we're it's here. We're here. You got to use us. Um, yeah. So sometimes special orders can be a bit of a bear. Um, I think when I have my druthers and I can just get into the studio and explore, I, I get really excited. I went and did a residency this past fall in Wyoming 
um, because I, I was feeling like I was spending so much time just making the same bowls and mugs, bowls and mugs, bowls and mugs, which I love doing, but it does get a little tedious and monotonous because that's mostly what people buy. You know, I, I enjoy making these huge flower vessels, but maybe I sell three or four of those a year. Um, and I would like to make like 50 of them a year. Um, so I went and did this residency and really gave myself some time to play with some really fun different flower forms. And I just had a show at the Clay Art Center in Port Chester, New York, that was all of these vessels that I'd made during that residency and since then. And that was really great. Um, but there's definitely, I think every potter sort of has that got to make the donut thing where, you know, how many more mugs can I really make? Um, and the answer ends up being thousands because that's what that's what sells the most. But um, I always try to every every kill mode let myself play with at least one thing. Um, but as a as a person who pays their bills by selling pots, you definitely have to uh, bend in some ways to what the market is is interested in. Um, but I I often find for me I get really excited when I get invited to be in a show that maybe has some sort of a different theme to it. Um, a, Last spring, I was invited to be in a margarita show that uh, Brett Kern, who's in your area, um, put together and curated. And I'd never made a stemmed cup before, and um, which is amazing because often in beginner intermediate classes in school, you get assigned the task of, of throwing sort of a chalice form. And I just I had missed that somewhere in my career. So I got really excited about making these margarita cups and I've been making juicing margarita pitchers in the past. So that's been really fun. Um, so sometimes I find that I am able to play when I have a, a purpose for the playing um, and some kind of a reason for, for making a particular form. So, yeah. I'm yeah. super curious now about your cake stand. I'm <laughs> Well, let me... I'll grab one um, so you guys can see what the cake stands look like now. And whoop, wrong button, that button. Um, so this is this is a, a small cake stand, you know, kind of normal size cake stand. And this is a, another one. But if you can imagine that, so these are like 10 inches across at the top, and I need to make this thing, I think 15 inches across the top or 16 um finished fired which means with the shrinkage of my porcelain they're just it's just gonna have to be huge and i am i i'm just dreading it like i make big things but not big flat things and big flat things that are gonna have to defy gravity like these big platters i mean the, the thing is going to be that size but that's going to have to be up in the air during the firing you know like it's gonna have glaze all over the surface I don't know that a single stand like the single stand should work still well I'm a little bit so this hooks in underneath like that and you can sort of if I can get the camera angle right it does warp just a little bit so I think I'm probably going to have to do a series where there will be something supporting the middle and then another layer on the outside and um I think elegance wise I'm just not sure how that big column in the middle is going to feel when it's all done. I don't know. Again, I'm just kind of I'm like, I don't know. I know I can, but I, I don't know if I'm going to love it when it gets done. Yeah. So we'll uh -huh. see. Ah, uh, the things people ask us to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and it's it's a family member too. So that, you know, adds a whole other layer to things that I, I, I might have said no. But yeah, so, oh, well. Well, anything else, anyone? I saw a few people have left. Um, we've got still a couple people here. Oh, I'm glad you enjoy it. It was good, Karina. Okay. Nobody else has any final questions? Well, I hope to see you all in person in the future instead of um, in virtual reality. Um, you know, there's definitely something said for, 
for actually being able to touch the clay in person instead of seeing it on your computer screen. But I am grateful that all of this has existed during this last year and a half. It's it's been been a hard time for people who work alone by themselves. Um, all right. Well, um, yeah, I guess let's wrap up. Um, thank you, Martha. Uh, that was really fun. A lot of people are commenting. That was fun. I really learned a lot. Um, I really appreciate how thoughtful you are and how you explain your process. You have a lot of really exceptional information, like deep dive information that I've certainly never scratched the surface of. <laughs> um, I would like to once again thank our sponsors and funders. Uh, we're grateful to the Fine Foundation, Bridgeway Capital, the Creative Business Accelerator, Simpson and McCready, and of course, Standard Ceramics Supply. Uh, Union Project is also partially funded by RAD, the Allegheny Regional Asset District. And then if you're not already, please follow Martha on Instagram at Martha H. Grover and uh, cross your fingers for pictures of a very big cake stand. I can't wait. <laughs> Um, we do, of course, have another nine days of Mother of All Pottery Sales. You can check out the full listing of programming, including later today, we're doing another demo with Karina Coyman, who's a local potter right here in town. We're very excited about that. And if you're local, you can go directly to our online shop, Union Project, well, union-project.square.site. We're doing a sale, but it's local pickup only. And then if you want to help us do more ceramic programs like this, we would love your support. You can make a donation at unionproject.org slash support. We, of course, will appreciate that. And yeah, thank you all for joining us. It was really delightful. Well, good luck with the rest of the week. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martha. Bye-bye, folks. <laughs>